so often, right, your strengths can be your biggest weaknesses. And that was exactly what happened that year. The good thing was we noticed we both had the same blind spot, if you like, because he liked to push the training and I liked to be pushed. And so we kind of kept going with it, even though like, I remember one time I came off the wall, so he was like, are you okay? You literally look like dead behind the eyes. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty tired. I was written off, like I was knackered, but I would not admit defeat. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Show Counts. We've got one of my rowing heroes in the house today, so I'm really excited to have a chat with Vicky Thornley. So please welcome Vicky to the podcast. Thank you for having me, guys. Good to be here. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, another one that was just an easy choice. Obviously, um, we've all rowed in the same club at times and in the same same teams uh, together. So yeah, that no, was, was a really good one. I think another interesting one, we haven't had any single scholars yet. So it's going to be a fun, yeah. fun thing to get into. the The mind of a of a single scholar is is normally a bit different from that of a of an H row. Yeah, Dave Bell said that single scholars are a special kind of weird. So we're going to fit that to a test. <laughs> Love it. We're all weird. We're all weird. Yeah. Single scholars are special kind. <laughs> yeah. And then, kind of looking at your statistics, I for, I, I didn't realize that both our our first uh, world rowing uh, regatta was two thousand nine under twenty three. Oh, yeah. yeah, good year. So, uh, oh yeah. Well, for you guys, it was really good. Uh, yeah, it's just to go through some of the highlights then. Um, so yeah, that 2009 under-23 is gold in the women's eight. Straight into Senior Wales a year later, which uh, I thought was really rare, but the more people we talk to, the more the more pretty incredible athletes we yeah. find who managed to do that. Um, 2011 as well, uh, Worlds in the women's eight bronze, and then 2012 Olympics fifth, and you stroke that. Then uh, into the single skull, a bit of a bit of a change from the women's eight. 2013 Worlds seventh, 2014 Worlds eight, 2015 European in the double was bronze, and then in the Worlds double sit, finishing that little campaign in 2016 in the Olympics with silver, obviously with Catherine Granger. Well, I'd love to talk about that as well. It's going to mm-hmm. be fun to get into. Uh, then again, went for the single, so uh, 2017 European champion. Uh, gold medal, um, 2017 World Silver, 2019 fourth, 2021 European Silver, and 2021 Olympics as fourth. But that's the highest placing British woman in a single score at the Olympics. That's right. So yeah, 12 years at the top, um, which is um, incredibly impressive. So I guess to start with, let's let's go with how you got into rowing in the first place. Yeah, I guess a bit different to a lot of people. A lot of people find it through school, university. Um, I definitely was no athlete when I was younger. Well, I used to ride horses and was very competitive in that. But I see the horse as the athlete and me as like the cox. Um, so yeah, I wasn't fit or strong or anything like that. But I was very competitive from a young age. Um, and then there was a talent ID search called Sporting Giants. It was, it was one of the first of its kind. has been a lot since. Um, and it was when we won the b- bid for London. Uh, Olympics so it was back in 2007 and it, they were looking for people of a certain height for certain sports one of the sports being rowing the other one was volleyball and I thought oh, I, I knew kind of being tall was helpful for volleyball and I could see me jumping around on a beach in a bikini so I like quite a good fun um, but then they picked me I like put my name forward for it I thought it was a really cool opportunity because I was kind of I'd finished the horses. I wasn't sure what to do next. I was going to university, but that wasn't really like exciting me that much. So I thought, well, this is a cool opportunity. Uh, and they picked me to test for rowing. Um, and then, yeah, so then I went along to the testing. There was like two weekends of it. Um, they test kind of like strength on the push and pull uh, dyno machines, that horrible arm leg swim bike thing. Well, uh, and then you had to do like a four minute test on the ergo at rate 24 or something. And my schools were very good, but like I remember Paul Stanard, who ended up being my first coach, um, now chief coach of the women and the men's team. Um, he just noted down like that I pushed myself really hard. So I think they saw that obviously I wasn't, I was pretty weak and not unfit, but they saw that I obviously had the levers, the height, and I could like push myself. So, you know, there's kind of the makings of a potentially decent rower. And I've been I've been tasked in the last ten years since then in, in keeping those dinos and swim bikes together. <laughs> yeah. So I have to head up to Hammersmith like three times a year, and the the world class start lot have like blown them to pieces. Yeah. Again. They're just trying to like piece them back together, and like Morris, like they're really hanging on, like really hanging on. And well, also, how many times have you been asked 
like when you sell someone, you do rowing to quite a high level, and then they get like, "Oh, does it have to be tall then?" Yeah, and quite. Like, well, yeah, <laughs> but there is like really, really amazing rowers who aren't obviously over six foot, like I am. Um, so, but it, yeah, it does, it does help. But then it also is, you know, makes things challenging in other ways. Like when I was trying to, you know, get more rate and stuff, like being tall is just like it was really hard to find rate and. So there's things that you, you kind of balance out with the yeah. long levers as well, because there's only so fast you can go at rate 30. And Paul Rishi in the single was like, can you please have at least three at the beginning of the, of the number of, in, in the rate, in the middle of the race? And like, cause sometimes I'd be like 29. He's like, no. <laughs> um, but yeah. I remember after when I first went down to the end, I was over at reaching quite long, being long as well, like a little bit taller than some of the other guys. I also spent like five years shortening my strength up. Yeah. And then we got telemetry. And then every coach is like, why aren't you rowing a bit longer? Like, you're really tall, you should row a bit longer. Like, is it your fault? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just getting that fine, that, the correct, correct balance for, for you, isn't it, as well? Yeah, yeah. So it was uni then, so it was Bath. So yeah, I didn't go to uni in Bath. So I was, I was at uni in London, and then I'd literally been there a month. And then after that Sporting Giants, they said, oh, I want to put you on the World Class Start Programme in Bath. Paul Sanner was my coach. So uni was like, I could do that anytime. So it was like four years, eight months by the time I started in Bath on the World Class Start Program to the London Games. So it was like, okay, it's like now or never for rowing. It's like an opportunity of a lifetime. Let's just go for it. So I didn't carry on studying. I was like, I'll do uni another time. Uh, I'm just going to put everything into into rowing. Even though I literally knew nothing about the sport, it was a big leap. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just well, a cool opportunity. Why not? It sounds like that's the attitude that Paul picked up on. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, i got to show this. Yeah. Sorry. Let's see, yeah, let's see what I can do. Yeah, so, no, it was um, it was cool. I literally moved to Bath not knowing anybody. I moved in with someone who's now, like, my best friend. I was, like, you know, a bridesmaid at her wedding kind of thing, but we'd literally met each other once at the kind of testing weekend, and I rang her up and was like, we're both moving to Bath. Do you want to move in together? And we literally moved in together, and, yeah, we're still really, really good friends now, which is nice. Awesome. Yeah. So then, so what year was that when you... When you that was sort of- basically my first day training was 1st of November 2007. Yeah, so literally the worst time. And they just obviously will start, they throw you in singles straight away. So literally spent that whole like winter just falling in. Because I was not, I literally the first session I fell in like three times. Then it was like two times, then once. And then I managed to do a couple of sessions without falling in. But yeah, I kept falling in and out of the boat for like the whole winter. It was freezing. And you know, oh, they teach you to get back in the boat. And those massive Yanisex, like 100 kilo Yanisex that you were, I was r- rowing in, they were like really rigid, hard, side so like trying to jump back in honestly i just like bruises all up my body from like pinching on the side of the throat getting back in it was miserable i was like what am i doing this is crazy but yeah uh, so again like, having coached uh people like the ones that fall in a lot are the ones that just like don't seem to have a fear of it yeah and i tell you what it was really funny i hadn't born in four years and i was tra- it was just before 2017 worlds we were at cavisham and obviously it was rough and uh, just before we flew out to sarasota and um it was really, really rough. And my coach, Paul Reedy, was coaching one of the the spares, um, spare girls in the single. And he, because he's like, oh, Vicky will be all right in the rough. I'll let her go on and whatever. And then he turns around and he sees me in the water. But then he says, before he had chance to like ring Morris or anything to say, like, can you come bring the safety boat? Like, I was back in the boat. But he, I was, he was like, what happened there? I was like, I don't know, but like automatically just like bounced back in because I just remembered it from so many years before doing it so many times. Yeah, I was like, that's not good though. I've just fallen in like weeks before the World Championships, but... I can't remember if I... Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have told this story before, but in 2013, there was like six of us in the senior team that didn't go to Worlds. We did this project over the summer with Mark Homer and then they said, oh, you, you should go up to the Sculling Festival, which is like a world-class start festival. In oh, yeah. Birmingham. And we went and did the we went and did the four K time trial, and then waiting to get back on the landing stage, I took my feet out, forgot I'd taken my feet up, then went to lean back to, and just like sat out the side of the boat. And like this is like a whole thing, world class start kids, everything, and there's like six athletes from the senior team. And Steve Gunn comes up to me after, he's like, "Oh, thanks, Tom, for uh, for falling in." Actually, to a lot of really nervous athletes that are now like feel a lot more happy about yeah, having seen yeah. the guy fall in. I was like, "Oh, yeah, cheers, Steve." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just happens at the weirdest places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so sculling. So was there much crew stuff, or like you said, it was just like there was. Yeah, because uh, obviously um, we trialed initially, like in the singles. Obviously, when we we're thinking about first doing our first, like, in a lot of trials on twenty threes, it was a single. But then eventually, the aim was to go and do it in a pair. So we did do some sweet rowing, but mainly sculling. And I think that is the best way to teach 
people a lot and doing in the single because if you can row a single I think you can kind of jump in and figure it out in other boats and I think sculling having the skills to scull leads you in a good way to like get some really good sweet round as well so uh, I think a lot of people don't like the single obviously but I think it is a really good training tool and yeah it gets you fit and <laughs> no one else will help you along and then also yeah just it builds your skills really quickly, you know. Yeah. If you don't work, work the skills early, then you'll just end up in the water. So yeah. if you figure it out quickly, right? Yeah, absolutely. You really have to be like be in tune with the boat and like get a feeling for like what the technique feels like, how how the boat moves, like how the blades accelerate the boat, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They normally say like all scholars can row, not all rowers can scull. They do say that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Well, and then you've taken both to the highest level. So again, there's probably not many athletes that have sculled and rowed. At the Olympics. Yeah, I guess not really. Uh, there, there, well, there was a few, but yeah, normally people stick to one or the other. Um, but yeah, it's kind of just how it kind of works out for me, I guess. And um, I broke into the team sweeping and then, yeah, just ended up migrating to sculling as I as I went on. Well, you always, yeah, everyone trials in the single first. So if you've yeah. got that speed in the single, I guess you've got options. Yeah, and yeah. And more, more places available to you, so why not? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then I guess they're coming, so I mean, or I normally would say to people like when did when did you start taking it seriously but I guess for you it was from day one yeah it was I never really went like pot hunting or like you know just had fun with rowing if you like obviously there was it was very fun but it wasn't like yeah I didn't necessarily row for fun it was like pretty much serious from the beginning uh, which is kind of just how it suits my kind of personality I guess I'm kind of all or nothing I mean yeah. most rowers are right but yeah um yeah so I, yeah I never really did it for fun necessarily but um it was kind of, yeah, like I said, I only had under five years to make it, to try and make it to the Olympic Games. So it was pretty much like head down blaze for like those five years yeah. to try and figure out how to do it well. Yeah. 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 Awesome. And then, so then I guess, uh, 08, like after a year of rowing, did you like, were you sort of doing Henley competitions, things like that or still? I think I did women's Henley, um, in 2008 and won the novice single, I think, uh, which was a really cool, um, obviously really cool thing to win so early on. Um, and then, yeah, I went to the eight and was always the trial for under 23s for the 2009 season. So that was like the big focus. So it was like 18 months, basically, that I, before I started to actually rowing at under 23. So it was a quick kind of um, thing, like rising to trying to go to like international level under 23s. But um, yeah, obviously I had, I was very lucky. I had like, you know, a great coach and like, it was very concentrated. We, you know, the whole point of work I start is to like fast track you, isn't it, into that um and i was lucky that i was able to focus purely on rowing from the off so yeah so then turning up was that like super nervous turning up to world championships 2009 yeah yeah because you would have been rowing with a bunch of girls who've done junior have got medals yeah it's like a classy eight yeah it was you know rachel jeffries was a stroke vicky bryant was bow like just those two alone had done like under threes twice before i think and won medals in like the four and stuff yeah um some great girls in that boat all of them like i still keep in contact with and really good friends with uh, you know a good few of them as well which is just like so nice to you know it's just rowing you know just breeds friendships that last a lifetime right and if you suffered together like that and won together lost together it just creates a bond that you can't yeah. re i just don't think you can recreate anywhere else and so yeah it's really special to have done that eight because i was in a boat with people who were really experienced um had done it before so i was just like right just put your blade in pull really hard and try and keep up you know and then i remember monica ralph's like well now middleton um one of my best friends she was behind me in the three seat i was in the four seat and i i think she realized how much like really really nervous on the start line and um she just like tapped me on the shoulder like you're okay you're gonna be good and I just, that reassurance, she's like, I know she would have been like, literally, you know, she would have been super nervous too, but she just, that reassurance that she gave me, I was like, nah, I can do this. I can do this. And uh, yeah. And it was, yeah, it was amazing. Like I was so lucky to, it all to fit in at the right time for me to be in that eight. And, you know, all those girls had like worked so hard and learned so many things up until that point at other untrained threes that they, you know, kind of made mistakes and then put it all together in that eight. And I managed to just jump in and yeah, keep up. So that was your first international race ever, and you ended up with a gold medal. Yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was cool. But I didn't really carry on like that, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, no, it never does. Um, but yeah, it was a big high very early on. But I was very conscious not to let it go to my head early, and like I wanted to prove as soon as I came back to Bath, I wanted to prove to Paul that I wasn't thinking that I was now like, oh, I know what I'm doing because I was very aware that literally that was I was very lucky to be in that position. Um, 
to to be in that eight and uh obviously i got myself and won my seat race to be in it but it was still like everything kind of worked out really well for me um but i wanted to make like make him realize i didn't think that i was now like knew what i was doing you know i had a long way to go so yeah but it was yeah it was a lovely way to start kind of my own career sure that definitely must have like spurred you on for like further training and being like okay well what can i do next like yeah if, if i just won my first international race world championships like shit yeah maybe i'm like saying to i have the olympics yeah yeah it was kind of like this is a good start but then i you know people always used to say like the difference between on 23s and seniors is like it's the biggest jump you can make so i was i was very aware of that yeah because it was it was a big step up and yet you did then step up so the next year was that just through the trials process yeah so it actually worked out well because paul was going to change jobs i think I don't know where he was. I can't remember where he was going to. Maybe he was going into the team or a different role. So he was moving from Bath. So we were going to have to move down. So the plan was for the athletes in Bath to move to Reading and join the centre there. Um, but I'd have been asked to go on a training camp um, in January in a Viz with the senior women. Um, and then the idea was to do February trials, see how I did and whether I'd get to ca- invited to Caversham. So um, it kind of worked out well. Paul was going. We were all going to move down this way. Um, and then... Yeah, February trials went well. The senior training camp went well, um, and I got invited to train at Havisham. But obviously, I had no training history at all. Right, I'd only been doing it like two years by that point. So um, that first year, I went slower before I went faster because I was just so tired from the training. You know, going from only two years of training history trying to like do a senior training program. I remember the two K that all uh, that april or march april i only managed to pull 704 or something like i had just managed the cut off because i was just exhausted um, yeah i did say the same thing my first year in the senior team you know rock up at boston and pull back a 609 I was yes. just like, what is wrong with me yeah it's just such a volume yeah the shift in training is yeah crazy so yeah it takes a while for your body to adapt to that and then actually see the benefits yeah mm. yeah but then again like exciting moving the right way like you've gone you're now talking what like less than three years from from picking up an ore yeah it was senior worlds in it was Karapira. yeah yeah new zealand yeah yeah um yeah and what a cool first senior worlds to go to out there um i mean the water was a bit rubbish but um it was a cool place to go and yeah and then we was a it was a good eight but it was very much we were building at that point um so i think did we finish fifth i don't even remember so bad isn't it uh, the, you've got a lot of uh of finals the, to remember yeah yeah, yeah. Fourth, fourth fourth okay yeah, yeah. all right um so yeah so um but i remember not feeling like we were close for a medal or anything like that so it was very much we were kind of building building into that um olympiad like towards towards london but it, yeah it was a it's a cool first time to be representing at senior worlds it was yeah. nice yeah and to be in an eight with girls that were really experienced like a lot of those girls had already been to olympics so again it was just like absorb it was always my like motto and it still is now and new things i do is like be a sponge like absorb everything you can from people who are better than you and have more experience and just learn as much as you can and i had to at that point right i was trying to get to the games in a small amount of time like there's no way i could have my own experiences because i just didn't have the time so i wanted to learn from others as well so that was always kind of my um yeah and also be a sponge that's the best that's a good piece of advice for anyone really yeah like especially if you're going to be around people and it's funny again i think we've mentioned this but like when you're last person in the crew you, you feel all that pressure of being like, oh my god like am i going to make it am i going to make it but then when you get to be like the first person in the crew you realize that oh, i like i'm kind of the best here now yeah it's like before it's like everyone's better than me yeah yeah you're right. like the ride of your life and yeah where everyone's better than you yeah it's like the best feeling yeah but yeah. you sometimes, I, I wish like I wish I could have been more aware of it at the time. I know, so it's... worried about not making the crew. Yeah, I think it's that's the thing with rowing. It's like I think I had the time and the headspace to think a bit more like this towards the last to the end of my career because I've been in it a while. And my husband Rick had retired a long time ago, and he just and even like the really bad days, he's like just try and like appreciate these last few years because once it's over, it's over, yeah. and you will miss you'll just miss the huge ups and downs, right? So like I try to soak in everything. Like I remember it's like going way into um further on into my career, but I remember in 2019 when we was trying to qualify the single for the Olympics, that World Championships was insanely hot. Like the racing was insane. Like people were literally running each other sort of standstill because just to get into the next like like just in the quarterfinals, people were like yeah. just doing races of their lives. And um I remember going down for the semi-final. Like, obviously, if I got through to the A-final, the qualification was secure. Like, kind of job done. Let's have fun in the final, see what we can get out of it. So I, I've never been so nervous 
uh, bar for the semi-final at the Olympics. Um, but yeah, up until that point in 2019, and I remember sitting on the bus on the way down, just thinking this, this feeling of nerves is like overwhelming. I knew how to deal with it in my mind. Like I practiced it and been there lots of times before, but I was super aware of like the kind of enormity of the nerves I was feeling, the anticipation. But I remember sitting there thinking, just enjoy this because right now you don't want to be in this situation. You don't want to feel like this. You don't want to feel this pressure in a way but you're going to miss this pressure. You're going to miss feeling like this. You're going to miss feeling this high and this kind of sense of like anticipation and um, being able to go out and do something you're really good at um, under real big pressure. And if it comes out good, that buzz you get from it. So I remember thinking just just embrace that. And I'm glad I had those moments where I could soak it in in a way and just kind of um, revel in that kind of th- those nerves as well because yeah. you just, you can't recreate that. Up Putting before. everything on the line. Me, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I remember the same. Yeah, it's one feeling I struggled with a little bit after having retired. It's like, there's like, there's no, there's not a lot of places in real life where you're like putting everything on the line, yeah. getting really nervous for something when you're like putting, getting yourself up for, for a performance. Yeah. It's just like life doesn't really work like that. And being really out of your comfort zone, even though you do it a lot, obviously in rowing, you race a lot, you train a lot, you put yourself in a lot of pain a lot, but it's that out of your comfort zone in every way, like mentally, physically, emotionally, and having to like, but equally control it so you still get the best out of yourself is is yeah it's it's only one you step once you step back and really look at how you did it you appreciate actually what goes into those performances i think that for me like that's the draw of rowing so people mm-hmm. ask me like what do you what do you enjoy about rowing well I, I don't miss the early mornings i don't miss the cold i don't miss the wet i don't miss the hurt, hurting myself so much you know i don't miss throwing up i've worked out i don't miss any of those things but like i miss achieving what i didn't think i could achieve i yeah. miss being in a position where i'm so nervous and so worried uh, i won't be able to perform and then performing and be like oh i got this yeah and i think that's like the thing that you get addicted to yeah yeah, yeah. and it's just like there's no perfect stroke there's no perfect race there's always ways to get better ways to be fitter be mentally fitter mentally stronger uh deal with nerves better so it's like the never-ending story you could that's why people go on for a long time in the sport because you can get always get better in some way if you like um yeah the year ago always wins yeah (laughs) yeah i I hate that saying it's like depressing when you think about it yeah uh i guess like next thing i guess i'll talk about 2012 olympics like what an amazing one to be a first one yeah i'm talking about nerves i guess that was that was another and when step up and when did you know you were gonna like make the team as well yeah it's a good question because a lot of people ask that because but you get your when you get your letter you would have got it for world championships and whatever as well but you get your letter and it says you've been selected. Congratulations! But we can change the boat at any time we like. Essentially, so you are selected, but then there's always that you you know. But it's not really you're not trying to keep your seat. You're just trying to make the boat go as fast as possible. But I guess after 2011, I threw the eight to a bronze. But then in 2012, we had I ended up starting the season in the women's quad, um, and then moving back into the eight. So there's a lot of it was frustrating actually because after 2011. They did. I did well in the single in the early part of 2012, and that's why um, Paul Thompson wanted me to carry on in the single and trial for the sculling team. But looking back, and I was like, I was I didn't know what I was doing. It was first year, first Olympiad, Olympiad, and whatever. So you can't I was like, say no. Yeah, and it was like, well, okay, that that's fine. I'll do that. But really, we should have concentrated on that group of girls that were based around that 2011 eight. Right, we'd done a really good job that year, closest to the Americans we'd ever got, won a bronze qualify the boat like let's have like 10 to 12 girls working in that group and move everybody move it on and keep that kind of momentum but we didn't and then we struggled with illness and injury and like I say I came back into sweep late later into the season got a bit of a like a sore rib because obviously I've been sculling and then went back to sweep my body wasn't very robust back then um and it just was a bit of a shaky shaky kind of season and a shaky preparation so in a way London now in hindsight and looking back I was like I'm very grateful to have been in the position where I would compete in a, a home games because not many athletes get to do that. And it just felt like the right time for me. Um, but we'll still be very disappointed with the result and our performance and kind of the way we, the build up. A lot of it was out, maybe out of our control a little bit. Um, but after such a good year, the year before, it was disappointing how we performed at the games. I remember sitting on the start line in the final not sure what the first stroke was going to be like, the second stroke, the third stroke, whereas, you know, you want to sit on that start line and be, we've practiced this over and over and we know, I know what 
we're, we're gonna we're gonna do. Uh, and we didn't have that because we didn't, hadn't had the preparation. So it was hard in that way. And yes, there was obviously masses of nerves, but and now I can look back and see how I was I was so immature in the sport and so so new to it and kind of like deer in the headlights a little bit. Um, but equally so grateful for that that experience and rowing with all those girls as well because you know had like like Svani Vernon who'd won a silver in Beijing um Tash Page now Townsend Jess Eddy like all these girls have loads of experience so if I hadn't have raced with them I wouldn't have learned all I did in that in that first Olympiad and it was like such a integral part of how I then moved on in the sport um but I remember crossing the finish line fifth and we were way out of we were nowhere near a medal um just absolutely gutted like absolutely gutted and it was funny because being literally at the Olympic Games then Rick kind of picked up the pieces because he'd I think he the day before two days before he'd won his medal in the eight he basically came picked me up um drove me back home literally 20 minutes down the road which is bizarre right um got into my house where my parents and my sisters and stuff have been staying and they were like let's get the champagne out I'm like what are you talking about the champagne you're just gonna be in the Olympic final I was like I came fifth like I'm gutted I just we're not getting the champagne out but for them it was like you know you just race an Olympic final it was really they were really proud of course and I was like you people are mad like no <laughs> but it's, it's, funny. It's, it's just yeah it's something I haven't explained to a lot of athletes again just how you did like so I went to Olympics and like obviously I was happy that I was there like you kind of have to put this this thing in first and uh, because it's just part of the mentality isn't yeah. it and it's like no one's saying that you're not happy to be there but also like being part of especially British rowing like the success is yeah. so high the expectation is so high um it's one thing I think it's a good thing for people to think about like supporters of rowers or family or friends and things like to understand that like of course they happy that they're there but they want more yeah like that that's what they're about and like that's what it is like, it kind of frustrates me you know, when you get the news lines, like, oh, they look so unhappy on the podium or they look so... And it's like, because they're aiming for perfection and yeah. greatness. And like, yeah. I'm, sh I'm sh you know, of course, everyone will look back and have the happy times. But like, you don't, you know, as it say, like, you know, reach reach for the stars, you'll hit the sky. Like, yeah. you know, you've got to aim higher yeah. in order to just achieve that. And the person that's just happy with being there isn't going to step on. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like two conflicting things. But I guess as well, like you said, you get your letter to go to Olympics a long time ago. Yeah, you've kind of that's like a win. Yeah, you've already celebrated. Yeah, yeah. Then the next, so like I've got my tracksuit. Yeah, yeah. You know, now it's about the next thing. What else can we do? Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, it's not. I think later in my career, as you get like a little bit wiser and a bit older and a bit more perspective, like when you're young, you're so like, and like you say, British rowing is all about medals. Like we were winning medals. Like so, so if you were winning a medal, you mm. you thought you were completely rubbish at rowing, which mm. is obviously not true. Uh, you're at Olympic Games, but it's it, that's just the way it was and it's kind of like a blessing that you're in a team that's so good but then it's also a curse because like I say you think you're a failure if you're not winning a gold medal or at least a medal yeah. so it, it's that makes it quite difficult but it's like you say it's what drives you on to the next thing so that like that kind of soul crushing disappointment when I crossed that line was literally what fired me the next four years to Rio and it's like I do not want to feel like this again like I'm going to do everything I possibly can to be on the podium in Rio because I've been, I've got the tracksuit, great, I'm Olympian. But now, like, there's no way I'm going again without, like, the priority is to get a medal in, in whatever boat that might be, but it is about signing on the podium. So, and that's what, yeah, kept me, like, pushing hard for the next four years. So so then was, was then going to Sculling, was that, like, a conscious choice? Like, because obviously you went in the single then, was that, like, I've got more control over? So, yeah, a little bit. So I definitely... I loved the eight and I, I love racing eights. I don't like training in eights, if I'm honest, especially, I mean, I mean, I threw the, the boat in 11 and 12, but especially in the middle of the boat, it's hard to feel stuff, whatever. Like, yeah, I find bo it boring rowing in training in eights, but I love the racing because of the energy and everything like that. Um, but I did want a bit more control over my own destiny. Um, and skull it, I think, well, actually in 2013, I was aiming to race the pair um and then that didn't work out and then I also then it was like okay I want to be in the double um I wasn't wanted in that so uh Paul Thompson wanted to put me back in the eight again and I was like at that point if I go in the eight what am I going to learn differently and like the first year of the Olympiad is like the time to try something new right it doesn't it's a it's a kind of a yeah of a gentle year um it's about time trying something new and like learning so I was like, go back in the eight, I'm not going to learn anything. I'm not going to learn enough. 
um, to, to put myself in a better position for 2014, 2015. And then ultimately the Rio Games. So I said I want to I want to have a go in the single, um, and I ended up was was selected to race the World Cup at Dorney in the single. I ended up doing surprisingly well. I ended up finishing fourth and doing quite a quick time. It was like Dorney when it was it was a quick day. Sure, I'm also time. That time, well, I say quick at the time, not necessarily. Well, no, it was quick. It was seven twenty five. Um, <laughs> it's about as fast as I've ever been. At the, the time, <laughs> at the time, it was like that was really fast for me. And then, but then, obviously, then I'd been in the single for five years. You think seven twenty-five? It was quick conditions. I should be able to do that most days. But back then, yeah, that was a really quick time. Um, so yeah, so I did that, and then so then he kind of begrudgingly let me go to Lucerne in the single, um, and I didn't do so well there. It's hard to do well in Lucerne. I've never done one in Lucerne. I think I won one medal in Lucerne. Um, and then he wanted to take me out of the, the single, but I really stuck to my guns and said, I, I either go to the worlds in my single or I'm winning it back to my club and race the season in my single, because I knew I, that was the best boat at that option in that opportunity to learn the most about myself. And I was really enjoying it. So, uh, I managed to find my way to race a single at the worlds that year. Um, so and it was really you, cool. Well, I guess that's an interesting one. Like, what kind of advice would you have for kind of at the time? It's difficult to know when to stick up for yourself, when mm. not to. Interestingly, Paul Stallard used to do my uh, performance reviews, and oh. the comment he would always say for me is like, "Tom, you're not sticking up for yourself enough. You need to, to you yeah. know, get your name in there a bit more." Uh, and I found it like a really difficult thing to do. Yeah, I think it's hard. It, it depends on your personality and like, um, but yeah, I think up until 2012, I was like. I didn't really know I wasn't that experienced and whatever. So you kind of just like keep quiet, get your head down and just do as you're told if you like. And then it was like, right, well, no, things are going to change. And after 2012, I was like, right, these are my areas that I'm strong in, these areas I'm weak in, and this is what I'm going to do to improve them. And it was like a lot of that was kind of um, strength and fitness based. And it was like, well, doing the single really helped with that. Uh, just the training volumes higher and the single naturally, obviously everything takes longer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just was like, it just felt like this is, that's what I should do. Obviously I had advice from people around me as well. Um, so, and sometimes it's really hard to like to stand up for yourself, especially with the chief coach to say, I'm either going in the single or I'm going back to my club. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do, but it was like, you put so much into rowing. It's like those difficult conversations are worth having if it's the right thing to do. So you just have to use like bite the bullet and just go for it and just be like, no, headstrong into it. Um, yeah, not saying that it was easy, but mm. you just got to trust this. Like, this is the right thing to do, so I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's good. yeah. So, yeah, so then obviously that year, so 2013 and 2014, so you stayed in the single after that year. Yeah, so the, I actually started the 2014 season with Fran Horton in the double. Yes, I remember. That's who I was trying to remember. Yeah. It was Fran. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like the tallest double in history, probably. <laughs> um, the longest legs in doubles in history, yeah. Um, and unfortunately, then Fran got injured. So I ended up going out to um, the the last camp for the Worlds when it was then decided Fran uh, wasn't going to make it back in time. And so I was in the single so I, yeah the plan was just to carry on in the single um and yeah it was a good year I think 2013 was a really really good year in terms of learnings um and then 2014 again the same uh Amsterdam was one of those lakes it's a bit frustrating I missed the a final but got to race the Olympic champion in the b final pushed us to the end so finished eighth so finished a place worse than the year before and it was kind of hard because I was like, right, I'm getting a bit sick of not being on the podium now. Like, let's, you know, let's get back to the podium. Yeah. And the single at that point, I wasn't good enough to be challenging for the podium. Um, so, yeah, it was like, okay, what's going to be in 2015? Um, and then obviously the, there was rumors of Catherine coming back. So I was like, hmm, okay, maybe. <laughs> we'll see what happens there. And then, yeah, and then she was the first day back training in 2015, Catherine was in the gym. She just turned up. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. I remember seeing something on, um, the re when I realized she was actually back at Caversham with it, you know that ice bucket challenge that people were doing? Uh, yeah, yeah. She did that and it was online somewhere and she was at Caversham and it was um, Morris that was tipping the ice over her head. I don't know, it was a really vivid memory and that's when I was like, oh, she's definitely back. She's in Caversham Wild. She should be at Caversham if she wasn't going to come back. So, yeah. So then that was like kind of the start of the doubles project, which was no way in any way smooth. But yeah, that was the start of that. Was there were there quite a few girls in the running for that, or 
Um, yeah, well, the sculling's like kind of all the scholars were obviously up for that. Like, I'd didn't win the trials in 2013, but won the trials in 2014. So, was just wanting to keep myself as the top scholar. Um, but there was obviously, yeah, people challenging for that, like Mel Wilson, yeah. um, obviously Fran as well, um, Beth Rodford. So, yeah, there was a few people around. And had Catherine said that she wanted to do the double? Or was no, I think the first year she was like, right, she needs to get back, yeah. to, like, fit and get back to a, to a level before we start kind of planning what kind of boat she's going to be in or whatever. So, yeah. And yeah. he went, so 2015, uh, when you won Europeans, was that with her in the double? Bronze. Um, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was with her. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I guess it's weird, isn't it? Because it's still a, a, like a title, but we kind of forget that Europeans is actually quite a big deal, don't we? Like for other countries, it is like people, they make a bigger deal out of yeah. it than we do. Um, it's because their funding is like dependent. Yeah, like the Romanians, I think, because a lot of it's based on... Uh, and the Polish too. Oh, sure. okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we did it, yeah, we did it when it was back in September. Or yeah. 2012, we did it. And then like the Polish and Romanian eight are there for like, like four weeks off from the Olympics. Yeah. What are they doing? Yeah, yeah. No. So they don't want it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so that was in the double with Catherine, yeah. Yeah, um, enjoyed it. Uh, how was that? Yeah. Pressure? Or well, I guess at this point, you've you've established yourself. Uh, I had, but you're still rowing with yeah. a rowing legend, right? So yeah. you kind of don't want to mess it up. And uh, we were changing seats between me being at stroke, me being at bow. And fundamentally, it was best if Catherine was at stroke because that's where, you know, it just felt better. But I wasn't used to rowing in the bow seat. It's so different in the double. Like the stroke seats to the bow seat is so different um so i was trying to learn that and like do the calls and so there was a lot of yeah that was quite a lot of nerves for me in most training sessions like just don't mess it up yeah, um yeah. but there's part of you has to like back yourself and be like no no i you know i've won the trials like i'm i'm, I'm good here you know um i've earned my seat here but you're still you're still rowing with somebody who's just incredible and yeah, you're um, gonna put that stuff to the back you know like i was thinking like oh oh were you in london being like four years ago i'd never rode like yeah no of course you wouldn't no. you can't do that yeah 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 yeah, there's always that yeah in the back of your mind, but um, yeah, you just try to kind of uh, put your game face on it, I guess, yeah. and then just approach them for as much information as you possibly can. Yeah, and the thing with Catherine is she's so personable and just easy. She gets on with anybody, like so. She just made she makes you feel comfortable. Um, so it wasn't like she was, you know, she didn't, she wasn't any more intimidating than, you know, she just naturally is because of her success. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was uh, so no. It was, it was, yeah, it was, it wasn't easy because we knew we both had really high standards um, and wanted to be fast and we fundamentally weren't that fast to begin with. So I think some of our results early on kind of um, complement us more than actually like the speed that we had. But it, the thing also with 2015, it was a really, really fierce um, doubles field that year. It was really tight and bracing in Varese. I think, I think we managed a bronze, it was a World Cup, but it was literally like, six boats in a line it was a really cool race um and yeah there was some really close finishes um so it was yeah but then obviously when and it comes to the wells we were kind of quite a bit off the pace it was like a lot of other crews seeing Catherine Granger and be like I want to pop yeah exactly yeah yeah it's a good kind of it's a good yeah it's a good head to get isn't it a good scout to scout to was that did you find that like more stressful like no longer being or like you know being the target or Uh, necessarily the favorite but Obviously, no. I would, you know, I find, I remember um, it was, I didn't put too much pressure and didn't think I wasn't good enough to be in that boat or row with Catherine. But I remember David Tanner at the World Championships in 2015 said to me, basically blamed me for how we weren't going very well. And um, and I, I can't remember what he said in the end, but I was like, this is not the way to like try and bring the best out of somebody. Like, I was like, can you just not? Like, I already obviously feel the pressure. But like, to basically, just say like you need to start pulling your weight. Essentially, said to me, I was like, I'm trying. Um, you know, look who you're rowing with. If it's not going fast, it's your fault. Is pretty much what he said. So I was like, okay, great. Um, that I kind of thing doesn't really help. Felt like he was being. He's kind of. Like, he was trying to motivate, but it wasn't coming across the right way, and yeah. so it was. Yeah, it wasn't. Not a stick, not carrot. Yeah, guys. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then sometimes if you don't take it the right way, it's not helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one way you like. Okay, this boat is flying before the Olympics. Like, when was that moment where it just clicked and you just started, like, you know, yeah. generating some serious speed? So we'd seen some speed, but it was like in fleeting moments and it wasn't consistent. And that's what the frustrating thing was. Um, and I think f- 
for a while, it was more, we rode quite differently. And so we were kind of rowing two singles and a double. Uh, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah, we were trying to figure out how to bring both our strengths because um, we had to compromise parts of our stroke to bring the two strokes together, if that makes sense. Um, so Catherine was very strong and very strong on the front end, whereas I liked to feel it lighter at the front and really accelerate through and kind of use my lever and long, long, um, long strokes. So it was trying to marry those up. So when I ended up being in the bow seat, it was like, right, no, I'm staying in the bow seat. I was having to really cut the finish short. And, but then once I started doing that, I was like, oh no, I'm really moving with her then. And it started, it started to come. I remember it was Paul Reedy who ended up being my coach for my single uh, for the last Olympiad. And um, it was the one thing that he said to me. Um, I said, what, what do I need to do to try and link up with Catherine better in the bow seat? Just finish, just fin feel like you're finishing before you've even like broken your arms. And then obviously you're not, you're still like bracing the, <laughs> the pack stops, right? But, and then, and that's what like, that was one thing for me that unlocked it in terms of like the timing with the boat and the timing with, with Catherine. So that was, it sounds like a really small thing, but sometimes that's the small thing that makes it feel lighter, makes it, yeah, it makes just everything flow. But it was when we were in Varese, so we'd raced the first, the last World Cup, and then we flew out to Bryjak, but the water there was really flooded, so we ended up having to decamp to Varese early or something. Anyway, we had some really nice water out there, so you could really feel the boat. Uh, and it, that was really important, I think, just to be on a flat lake and just be able to really get in tune and that's when we started to be like, okay, it's getting more consistent and the pictures, the videos, the feeling, everything was starting to come together. Um, but it was kind of like we'd had such an up and down season with selection and all that. At that point, it was like, it's you know, we just throw everything at it. You know, we've been through the ringer in every way. Like, let's just enjoy rowing, enjoy trying to get speed from this boat and take the pressure off because it had been like so stressful that year. Like beyond, it was let's take the pressure off and remember why we enjoy it, why we enjoy it push off from the bank leave all the shit on the bank that's happened and just go out and enjoy the boat and that's when things started to we stopped i may be trying so hard if that makes sense like when you're trying to make something work so so much it sometimes complete it has the opposite effect yeah, right? yeah, yeah. um and then yeah and that's when we started to see some speed um but it wasn't like we went to the olympics thinking well, now we're definitely going to be challenging for medal. We we know we'd got faster, but we didn't know how fast that was compared to everybody else. So so that year was kind of the year that the, the rowing kind of got into the limelight a little bit. There was mm -hmm. some stuff came out in the papers and things like that. And like, without getting into it in loads of detail, like dealing with that stuff, like it's kind of rare that rowing comes out mm -hmm. like that big. Like how was it hard to deal with? Like you said, like trying to put it behind you and leave it on the bank. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a guy. It feels like such a long time ago now, but that was... Yeah, it was the most stressful year ever in I've in my own career. Um, because of all the selection issues, obviously Anna Watkins came back into the into the frame for the Olympic year, and that kind of just it was hard because obviously they they'd won in London, and it was like one of the best doubles of all time. Um, in a way, they probably the idea of like it was a romantic idea of them recreating that. But I was like, hang on a second, I'm here. I'm the top scholar in terms of trials, like, you know, so I, I was challenging that as well. But basically, none of the, there was four of us in the um, doubles project, Anna, Catherine, myself, and Mel Wilson. And, but none of the combinations were flying. Some of them were quite fast. Some of them were fast, but it, none of them were quick enough. And that's why in fe February, I was like, I don't think, I think we should maybe abandon the doubles project and go for another boat because I don't think we're hitting the speeds we need to. Um, and it was a conversation we all had around the table with Paul Thompson, um, but it was decided we'll keep going for it. And then once we got selected, Catherine and I got selected after seat racing, the first race we did it was awful water. I can't remember where it was, Brandenburg or somewhere like that. Um, and we didn't do very well. And then it was okay, right, well, that's reinforced my idea that this isn't, this isn't quick enough. And Catherine kind of felt the same. Um, that's when we started looking to, to the eight. Obviously, that didn't go down well with the eight, understandably. But fundamentally, like I said to you, when I finished in London, Rio was about, at that point, it was about a medal, yeah. like regardless of the boat. And, you know, I fought my way to the top of the team. So I want I want to be given the best shot of a medal. Um, and obviously, that didn't, you know, it's obviously going to upset some people. And I completely understand it. But it's, you know, it's Olympic sport. It's cutthroat. You, you do what's best. 
for yourself um, to put yourself in the best position. Um, so I probably wasn't flavor of the month with a lot of people, but again, it was like, I've sacrificed a lot, like, like everyone has there, but like, I'm gonna just fight for, you know, what's best for, for me. And, and then, so yeah, that was difficult. And then switching to sweet for like a month before we'd ever see a race for the Olympic, the Olympic eight, um, it was, it was just pretty harrowing and people, I didn't want to, a lot of people didn't want to talk to us and stuff like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't nice. It was risky, uncomfortable most of the time um but you just had to kind of ride it out and yeah it it wasn't a, it wasn't an easy time i mean sea racing at the best of times is incredibly stressful yeah. like, there aren't many sports where you're in direct com competition with your friends yeah you know like if you play football there's 11 different positions there might be two or three people going for one position but you're yes. all in the mix for the same thing like you like i can't imagine that adding extra stress to that would be yeah yeah and raising the competitiveness of the entire squad probably is also what yielded two medals at olympics so yeah. that's not necessarily a bad thing either no, sometimes no, no. some people need to get a kick up the ass in order to just basically make everyone just realize oh shit like my seat really isn't guaranteed yeah i have to like go for it otherwise yeah. otherwise i'm gonna come fourth or fifth again yeah yeah and i could i can i could see it from everybody's perspective but like i say i was just being like right I, you know, I wouldn't need to be in the best boat possible to win a medal. And that was, that was my focus. And I was, I was unbelievably blinkered at that point in the year. I was literally like crazed. I was like, just, yeah, head down, like kind of, yeah, you do. And like, but it was taking up everything of me. Every morning I'd wake up with knots in my stomach. I felt sick. It was just horrible. Uh, and go to Cabersham and it just felt like a horrible environment to be in because yeah, I was just ruining you know the eight were having a great time they were going fast they were like stop stop ruining our fun like essentially um and yeah so it, it wasn't easy but um yeah you just have to kind of stay tough in that situation and keep pushing um for what is the right thing then obviously we didn't get selected for the eight so then it was like right double or nothing and i honestly literally was, double or nothing uh, yeah yeah <laughs> i was i was very close to being like nah i'm, I'm done i can't i don't know where i'm gonna put, find the energy um, I didn't want to go to the Olympics again and just get a tracksuit. So, and I didn't think the double at that point was quick enough. It was a real, I went, I remember going for a, I entered the first one ever, never, never turned up to Cabersham apart from if I was ill, but that was rare. I, the morning after the seat racing in the eight and Tom Road called me that evening and said, you haven't made it. Um, I didn't, I just didn't turn up and say I wasn't turning up. I just didn't turn up. I just couldn't face going in. I went training, went down to the end and did an ergo, but, um, yeah, and I went for a walk out the back of my house and was just like, what do I want to do? I was I was in bits and it was just emotionally, I think, I was so drained. And like at that point, you're having to push again, right, to another level for the, the preparation of the Olympics. I'm like, where is that next level? Like, I'm going to have to go so deep to find the energy. Um, and I was like, but then fundamentally one morning I just woke up and I was like, can I stop now and and be happy with not knowing how it might go in literally six weeks' time? Um, and the answer was no, I won't be able to be, I won't be able to live with that. So, um, I remember, I think it was Rick that asked me that question and I was like, yeah, I can't not know. Um, but I was like really guarding myself for a, a devastating result in Rio. So I think when we ended up winning a silver, it was, it didn't say sinking for so long because I was so, I was, yeah, I was kind of in a defense mode that if it doesn't go right and I'm then again, disappointed. I was kind of preparing myself for that disappointment before we even got there. It sounds crazy, but I actually think it's just like a, because you put so much emotion into the sport, right? You kind of have to like guard your. When you add the from it. physical requirements is so high, and then you yeah. add like the emotional stuff on top, it's like unbelievable. Yeah, it's interesting what you said. You're not the first to sort of spoken about the fear, not not the fear of that you wouldn't do it or you weren't capable of do it, and just knowing how deep you were going to have to go. Yeah, it's like I know. It's like I know I've been there. I know what I have to drag out myself. I'm yeah. saying I won't, but like, oh my God. This it's going to be a mountain to climb, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's also really interesting to hear, obviously, you going to Rio with an attitude of like, oh, I really don't know what's going to happen, but you ended up leading most of the final. I know, right? <laughs> it was mental, yeah. So after all of that, we got out there and actually the, the pressure had lifted and in those training camps, we had a, we had some really lovely rows. Um like me and Tomo, we'd 
really not seen eye to eye that year. But then once everything had settled and we said, okay, right, we're giving the double the shot, like let's go with it. We both put all our kind of arguments and stuff to the side and like respect to him for that because that's, you know, a lot of stuff had been said. Um, and then we were like, no, we need to work as a as a team and let's just move past it and let's in, try and enjoy it because there's so much crap had happened. It's like, let's just try and enjoy it for what it is. And uh, so we actually, I actually really enjoyed those last six weeks. I think it was like a 50 day project. We, we let them, by the end of the, we did the last World Cup together and then we had 50 days before we got to the game. So it was like, right, the 50 day project. And it was actually really enjoyable. And yeah, the, I think the Heat, we came second. Semi, we came second. Um, so the Lithuanians in the Heat and then the Polish in the, sem in the Semi maybe. And they were the two like good, good kind of crews that have been like consistently meddling. Um, but I remember before the night before the Olympic final, I just, I just said to, which, you know, we'd have a lot chat for it's always so weird isn't it like it's the date night before you have this chat and then you and the, like emotions are like so high and then it's going down to dinner and kind of try and calm down and just like so psyched but and I remember just saying I don't know why I feel it but I just feel like something special we're going to deliver something special tomorrow and I don't know why I just had that feeling that something special was gonna gonna happen not I, I wasn't even putting that onto a medal I wasn't like saying special medal it was just I just knew that it was just it start it just clicked and it was like we were finally finding the speed and working together and working with the boat and finally finding what you know we and a lot of people knew we were capable of but in a way because no one expected us to be quick there was kind of less pressure um and yeah and then uh, we had the worst first stroke we got like the, again this i've talked to so many stories and there's so many times where it's been like really bad water but it's literally everywhere um, it was really, really rough. It was a big headwind, um, which kind of suited us because we were like, obviously, like big and strong. But the f worst first stroke, um, literally, was we got him like a length down or something like very early on. But then, um, yeah, and then we kind of sprung out and got into our rhythm. And yeah, and then I remember um, halfway thinking, oh, oh, God, we're ahead of the field. And I was like, oh, this is the Olympic final. It was, and then for the split second later, I was like back onto the onto the kind of process, but it was a bit like, oh God, this is the Olympic final and we're leading. Um, and it just felt very in control. It didn't, I think because the wall was so rough and it was really heavy and slow and whatever because it was a massive headwind, it felt very re relaxed in a way. It was like we we just rode the most relaxed we've ever rode, even with it being an Olympic final and the, and the waves and all that. And obviously as, as we got closer to the finish line, the, the water calmed down a little bit, but yeah and we were we just had an amazing race um and fundamentally we delivered our best race on the day that counted um yes the polls came through us at the end but i always now especially little well, later on in my career it's always like performance like you can't slow anyone else down in rowing right it's a non-contact sport so was that our best race for that in that point of time yeah i think it was it was our best race we'd ever done and we did that in the olympic final someone was slightly quicker that is and you know but fundamentally we crossed the line in a silver medal position at the olympic games and i'd never been on the podium before um we'd had an amazing race together um and after everything that had happened as well i think it was just made it even sweeter to That's stand good. on the podium was it good it was yeah it was pretty surreal and i always will remember the weight of that the really good medals so one one olympic medal that was the ones to win it was a really cool one uh really heavy really big and i remember the weight of it going around my neck and i was like God, that's the weight, like symbolize the weight of everything that is taken to get here, right? Um, and yeah, it was just an immense feeling and seeing everybody in the crowd, like my parents and like I say, picked me up from like the gutters and tears so many times. And it was like, I wanted to win it for me and for Catherine, but I wanted to win it for them because they'd seen me like so, so devastated so many times. And, you know, and they all, they've been to basically every race I've ever raced across the world. And um, it was just like nice for them to be able to enjoy watching me actually be happy because they they don't care where I finish right they just want me to be happy so um, yeah that was that was really special yeah that's good like because you you know when when fantastic athletes have great achievements most people in the stadium watching that's the only bit they see they see the good bit yeah the good bit the good bit but it's only really the family that sees all of it yeah and everything else that comes on. Um, and I think it's interesting what you're saying about the night before, you know, you're talking about having a great race that night before you weren't talking about, come and get medal, come and do this, come and do that. Like come and nail our performance. Yeah. Can we look at the process and like you say, I think we can really nail this tomorrow. And you went out and you nailed it. And like, I spoke a lot about this process driven, process driven, like 
how can I get the best performance for myself? Because ultimately, like you said, whoever else comes, they come. Like all you yeah. can do, and you've got to look back. Like every race, I look back at the, the ones I couldn't give an I couldn't give an anything else. Yeah, win, lose, or draw. Like yeah, I couldn't give anything else. You get to walk away happy. Yeah, exactly. And you get to sleep at night. I think the one the way you let yourself down because you are too in your head or whatever. That's when you really struggle to let go of it. But when you yeah, when it was like, well, I did everything I possibly could in that race, and I delivered. 100% of me on that day. That's all that you can do. We watched back a bit of some of the races the other day and uh, sitting with Pete, who's Polish, and him saying, oh, yeah. coming to the finish, was like, I was really annoyed when the Polish came to <laughs> I was like, Pete, you're Polish? He's like, yeah, but like, the Leander was my claw. Yeah. <laughs> Love true. it. That's yeah, true. Yeah. No, I, I, they were a classy was, crew, though. They were very good. <laughs> they were, but I was rooting for you guys. And obviously, <laughs> oh, like, for my club, you. it's like club before country for me. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> So after the Olympics, I guess you got back, the pressure all came off and then the emotions have settled. Did you know you were going to continue or? No, I didn't at that point. And because so much had happened that year as well, I was like, I'm not sure what the team's going to look like. I don't want to be in that. Like my day to day hadn't been enjoyable for about a year. And there's only so much, so many years of that you can take. So I had to change things to if I was going to carry on, uh, which would mean working with a different coach. Um, and I communicated that to David Tanner. Um, but it, yeah, it took me till the, I knew I was going to take the, till the January off anyway, but it, yeah, I started, decided by the end of December, I was still kind of like, I'm not, I'm not sure. But fundamentally it came down to, do I think I can be better? Um, and have I reached my, my best in the sport? And the answer was I haven't reached my best. And I don't want to finish the sport thinking, what else could I have achieved? Um, and I remember Catherine actually asking me in the second week in Rio, like, what did I, if I was going to carry on, what boat would I want to do? And I did mention the single at that time. And then as the months went on, when I was thinking about my decision, it was, for me, that was the only boat I wanted to go back and do. Um, I wasn't interested in another crew boat. It was I wanted. I remember seeing Nat Kova win the single in London, and I mean, she absolutely demolished the field, and she it was just beautiful sculling. And I think, and she crossed that line. I thought that must be the most incredible feeling, winning Olympic gold, obviously, but winning. I don't know. For me personally, it might sound selfish or self indulgent. I don't know what, it, but I just thought the single for me is just like the event, and to do it, to try and go to the Olympics and win a gold medal in the single is wow. You know, and but at that point it was like I never thought I'd be good enough to challenge in that event. So, but I remember seeing that and thinking that would be for me that would be the ultimate. Um, and then at that, and after winning the silver in Rio, it gave me that kind of extra confidence that if I'm good enough to win an Olympic medal in the double, then I can, you know, I've got a shot at the single, and let's see if what I can do in that event. And it was more about a personal exploration about how I good I could be. Like I knew I didn't have the engine of some of the single scholars. Um, and that's the one thing Rick said, like, he said, that's probably an area that you'll struggle in the event if you haven't got, you know, if you're not pulling below 614, you know, a lot of them are in 630s, even the 620s. And if you're not doing that, you might struggle. Um, so you have to kind of obviously use your other strengths to kind of, but um, yeah, it, for me, it was just like a personal journey. How could I be as an athlete? And the single is the, the kind of the boat that shows everything of what you are. Yeah, the ultimate tester because you're 100% responsible for whatever that boat does. Yeah. There's no one else that can, that can do anything else to it apart from the, probably the pleasure boat slow, slow yeah. you down to watch. Yeah. I think yeah. as well, like like saying maturing as an athlete, like for me, they got to a point, um, especially sort of post rowing when I wanted to do other things or challenge myself in other ways, I became less and less interested in whether I could or couldn't beat other people. Yeah. Like if someone's beat me, like, well, then they're better than me. Yeah. If they didn't, then they were worse. But can I beat myself? Yeah. And yeah. Like, that's the draw of the 2K on the ergo. It was like, there's no one harder to beat than yourself. Yeah. And that draw becomes m much more interesting. than I went back and I played rugby for a bit. And, uh, uh, you know, we'd lose a game, but I'd have a great game. and But the team would be like, we've got to be upset. Yeah. Like, we messed up. We did it upset. I had, a, I had a great one. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I can't control what any of you were doing. And, like, it doesn't really matter what else was going on. It's sort of only really sort of interested in my own performance and probably came from Rome because it's both a team and an individual sport. But um, yeah, no, something I've heard from a few other people, like ultimately it just becomes like how good 
can I get? And again, like work for me, like walking away from the sport was like, I've done, I've done everything I'm going to do. Yeah. And then you can walk away happy and like, I'm very, really like happy that I had the opportunity to get there. Because I know a lot of the guys I rode with, like, injuries or illnesses or uni or whatever. Didn't have the control over it, yeah. That feeling of like, what if, what yeah. if, what if. Yeah. And you don't want to walk away with a what if. Yeah, but equally, I, even though the for me the single was all the, always the ultimate, I wouldn't have changed any of the years before it because they those lessons, rowing with those women, like they're what made me the athlete I was at the start of the singles project, right? And so... If I hadn't have done that, hadn't had those experiences, hadn't rode with those girls, then I wouldn't have been an athlete. I was to then take on the challenge of the single. So I, that some people have obviously had their whole career in the single. I actually love that I've rode in other boats, um, had those experiences, had those wins, had those losses. Um, because yeah, I wouldn't have been the athlete I was come 2017 when I took on that singles project if I hadn't done those boats. So, um, yeah, so I'm super grateful for those years because yeah, they stood me in. You good test you can't think. take anything away it's every every experience is part of yeah. what brings you here yeah. absolutely yeah so then was it was it daunting then knowing that this next four years is it's me and my single and that's it smoking <laughs> yeah. boats um i mean obviously it was a fight to stay in the single and there was lots of times where um people were questioning whether i should stay in it whether i was quick enough um but you've got to have belief in yourself in the single if you don't have belief in yourself you just you might as well stop right there so 2017 was a great first first season in it um really enjoyable got uh so i started the um project with paul reedy as my coach uh always had massive respect for reedy like he's an incredible coach obviously he's been an athlete olympic silver medalist himself so he gets it on the athlete's perspective he treats you as an equal he looks after you as a person as well as an athlete like it's not just all about your athletic performance he wants you to be enjoying it and all that as well so um really enjoyed that first year um won the europeans which was really cool uh raced uh katarina carson obviously an absolute legend um and she wasn't happy um in that race because uh, it was really tight at the end she came back in the last bit and i managed to just hold her off um and yeah i mean that was cool just to, to race someone like that right she's incredible um so that was really cool and then yeah, and then silver at the worlds. I mean, had it just had a great season that year, and it was just it was just fun. It was just back to like, yeah, having a lot of fun. Um, and I'd had that that prolonged period of time off. Well, a lot of people have it after a couple of games. They normally have till the January just to kind of recharge. Um, and I'd really enjoyed that time. Um, but then yeah, I just had a really fun. It felt like a really quick season, and we were into. It felt like we were into racing really quickly. If you start in January, right, you haven't done like yeah. October, November, December slog um so yeah it was just a really good good first year it's um, funny um i keep going back to now like ben lewis we was you know oh, you've been such a successful coach ben you know what what jeff did what is wearing all about turn up train hard have fun yeah and he's like it's those three things yeah and without one you can go for a little bit yeah but you know, you're gonna fall over if you don't have all three at yeah. some point that's why i said like 2016 for the majority of it wasn't fun and it was hard and just not very enjoyable but you can't, you can't, you can't have, you can't just do the training hard and turning out without the fun yeah. that long. Um, so 2017 was like a reset and a refresh and a, oh yeah, rowing's fun again. Loved working with Reedy, loved like kind of building that relationship. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a good start. Awesome. They went yeah. drastically downhill. <laughs> yeah. So what happened in 2018? Was that um, overtraining or cool. whatever people call it? There's like lots of different terms. Yeah. Right? Rudders. Um, yeah, a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more coming out about that now, which is, which is good because it needs to be more talked about, um, for sure, especially when it comes to women, uh, and menstrual cycles and that kind of thing. Yeah. But for me, yeah, I just pushed it way too hard. So obviously I was like, I won, won silver in 2017. Uh, it was my second 500 that let me down. Right. Okay. That was just the training I hadn't done before January. So like, I'm going to really hit this winter really hard. Not like I'd not uh, hit every other winter really hard, right? And I just didn't respect the single. Um, like doing everything in the single is just really hard on your body, right? 18K in the single compared to an eight. It's 20 minutes longer minimum. Like every day that builds up. Training time is massive. Um, and I was just pushing things too hard. And I felt on top of the world, like I'm physically in that winter, I was like firing. I did a PB on my 5K. Um, was like definitely going to pull sub 640 come March. Then in February comes, I get 
ill quite soon after the 5k which i don't get ill very often but i had the first chest infection i've ever had oh this is weird um tried to push through it get back quickly because and rick was like you've got a chest infection you can't just stop keep training and i was like really i've never had a chest infection he's like how have you not had a chest infection you've been rowing for like 10 years i might like, never had one um and so i didn't recover properly off that and kept trying to push through and then fundamentally like my body was just struggling 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 um and me and really after after we'd gone through all that and like come to the end of it when i had to like call time on the season we the good thing was we noticed we both had the same blind spot if you like because he liked to push the training and i liked to be pushed and so we kind of kept going with it even though like i remember one time i came off the wall so he was like are you okay you literally look like dead behind the eyes i'm like yeah i'm pretty tired i was written off like i was knackered um but i would not admit defeat like and it was my stubbornness the thunder my like so often right your strengths can be your biggest weaknesses and that was exactly what happened that year and i was experienced i knew like but i just wasn't listening my body was telling me but i wasn't listening to it um and then the first race i had to like literally end myself to get like a fourth or a fifth or something this world cup and i'm like i don't think i'm rowing that badly like why am i not quicker like i've done so much training and the same thing happened in the next couple of races and then in henley just been i'd never never race well at henley royal it's um never won henley um but it's, which is always like Argh. but um yeah and i remember in the semi-finals racing this australian scholar good scholar but like i was better than and she just literally had my pants down so it was like i remember coming back into the boathouse at the and like i was in tears like i don't know what's happened like why am i so slow all of a sudden like but my body had been telling me for a while i just hadn't been listening well, that's the difficult one because in a in a sport like rowing, you make a career out of uh, ignoring. Yeah, you, you, you that's how you get good at rowing. Yeah, to start to ignore the safety switch. That yeah, says, you should hold back here. Yeah, uh, I'm having more. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, that the I think what happens is kind of the the volume of the safety switch goes down and then yeah. down and down, and it's kind of telling you, but you've you've learned how to push it away. Yeah, and also you have to trade on the red line, right? There's like if you're too, if you're training this too far this side of the red line, you're not pushing hard enough, and you're not going to get that adaptation to get fitter. And sometimes you will train on the wrong side of the red line, but then you can't stay on that all the time. Like you've got to come back. Like that peaks and troughs of training, like that's normal, right? You get tired, but then you recover. I wasn't getting back out of the trough, and then I was going to another one, and it was just, it was that. Um, but like you say, yeah, you just kind of just headstrong into it. Like could be tough, and da -da -da, and actually, no, nah, it's just yeah. So. I didn't go to the Europeans and I tried to take a couple of weeks just taking it steady, doing the old 12k ergo, recovery 12k ergo. <laughs> so yeah. literally everyone's been there, how they? But it's literally like, <laughs> why is it 12k and why is it always like, yeah. So you're going to do six and six first, yeah. have a break, see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh God, so frustrating. Um, and so I was doing less training and I was going backwards. My spits were getting worse. I was, and literally it felt like, all I can explain was it felt like every cell in my body was tired. Like that's how I felt. Um, so after two weeks of like taking it easier, like I've got worse in a way. I think my body started to be like, oh, well, she's taking it easier. And you know, and you, you know, like after, um, after a training camp, you taper, but you feel more tired uh, before you start feeling better. It was a bit like that, I think. Um, and so we had some conversation obviously with um and redgrave the doctor and it was like yeah i'm i'm not getting better and it's not i'm not going to get better in time so then it was that cool time on the season so that was a big blow and then it was like trying to manage mentally not doing any training for a month it was like she you have to you have to be off for a month i said what no training she's like yeah i said well can i go walking she's like not really she said you can go for like half an hour, 45 minute walk, do some yoga, that is it, she for a month. And I was like, I just mentally, I'm like, how how can you do that, right? When you're, yeah, it's just, it was hard to get my head around that. Um, and Rick was like, well, think of it as a training camp in recovery. And that was, that actually really helped because yeah, at least then I could be like, put some, yeah, put some focus towards yeah. it. Yeah. So I just ate a lot, slept <laughs> a lot, and tried to, yeah, tried to be the best recoverer I could be. Um, and put on a little bit of weight, which I think was good as well, just to like really top up my energy um, and just give my body a break. Like it, mentally, it was not easy. 
Um, but after a couple of weeks, I started to get a bit better at it. Um, went on a holiday, spent some time with my mum and dad. Like that kind of stuff was was nice um, to to do. And I had no choice. It was like if I don't do this, there's no. I'm, I'm not going to get better. I'm not going to get back. So there's there's no choice. Um, so I just had to get my head around it and get on with it, basically. Um, but then actually, that that wasn't the most frustrating part. It was the building back up. Because I thought oh, I'll have a month off and then I'll just like do a little bit of a build up and then I'll be back into training. It was like months of like 30 minutes UT3 on the bike, a week of that. Oh, it's still not quite right. Another 30 minutes. And then it was like, oh, 45 minutes. And it was literally building up like that. And that's when that was frustrating because yes, you were training, but you weren't making any difference. You feel like you're getting left behind by everyone else. Oh yeah. Because by the time everyone was back, I was still doing like 45 minutes of the bike UT3. Um, and, and then it was the Olympic qualifying year, like it's yeah. the biggest year bar Olympic year. Right. So it was. Yeah, I was, and it took me a long time to get my fitness back, um, a long time that, that season. Um, because physically, like, I'm naturally quite good, but it's not my strongest area. So, like, yeah, it was it was hard to get to get back. And I only really, I had to kind of fast track it a little bit. Um, and that's when Jürgen was actually doing our, uh, was the chief of men and women. And he gave me a bit of a different program. I did a lot more intensity in the, like, World Cup season because um i was just struggling with lactate threshold because i hadn't done much of that um so we changed it up quite a lot uh, and that helped kind of like fast track but um yeah i finished seventh at the europeans that year um and i was like god oh, i've got a mountain to climb i've got to come top nine just to qualify the boat <laughs> so um yeah but i managed to kind of yeah fast track the getting back up to racing speed um and like you say in the single lifts if you're not firing, the boat ain't going nowhere. So, yeah, no yeah. to hide. No, yeah. So, having gone through all that, any advice to someone who is struggling in that way or is going through that? Yeah, I just either, either identifying it or what do you do about it afterwards? Yeah, well, I think it's identifying it and just like chatting to a doctor who knows about it. To say like, this is what I'm, this is what how I'm feeling, and this is my performances and where things are going because everyone has different markers and different like um reference symptoms points. yeah and reference points as of you know because some people might drop weight some people might gain weight so i was i was really struggling and was under fueling probably and not recovering well enough but it was actually like putting putting weight on because i think my body was like going into i don't know survival mode or whatever everyone has different markers so um it's just recognizing your body um and what it's telling you and, and fundamentally listening to it because it will tell you when it's not right um so yeah, and then once you kind of seek help, just making sure that you're doing the right thing to get to get your body back. Um, but yeah, fundamentally just understanding how much you're asking your body and making sure you're putting the like the nutrition and the fuel back in, but also recovering around training. I was very busy that year outside of rowing, which was another factor to why I struggled because I was like, I wasn't going home and just resting. I was doing other things too much, and that's um, you can't do, you can't burn the candle at all ends. Um, were you keeping a training diary at that time? Like, were you like keeping like numbers and stuff? That's yeah, I. About before. Yeah, I did. I was pretty good at keeping a training diary, and obviously, all our scores and stuff were monitors and everything. Um, and the thing is, my UT two and stuff was fine. It was more when I went up um, to race pace stuff that, and my legs were just like burning all the time. Like when I ever did anything hard, but like not normal you know you could normally do like 500 meters without it being like but it was like from straight one i was just yeah my muscles were just so fatigued so um there was definitely yeah there was definitely things telling me that things weren't right so yeah it's just about yeah it's fundamentally listening to your body and not ignoring the signs yeah i mean everyone's done it's it. hard everyone's yeah. done it i did um i was doing a weight session at bisham and i'd had problems with my back previously it had been all been going quite well i did a power clean and i felt I felt something go. Yeah. And I just convinced myself that nothing had gone and then finished like the end of the weight session and just obviously made it so and I like look back and think like, would I have got back quicker if yeah. I had just been like, no, something happened there. Yeah. Um, so I think everyone's done it. Yeah. So from finding yourself in that situation where you can't you, you don't see the same athlete that you once were in the mirror and obviously coming seventh at the Europeans, how did you eventually qualified a single and got back on track for the Tokyo Olympics? Um, just a really good plan uh, between myself, Reedy, and Jürgen in terms of my training program. 
we changed we changed it from what everyone else was doing because we recognized that I needed to do more high intensity. So took the volume down, did more pieces um, to kind of fast track that kind of race pace um, speed and kept kept believing, kept the faith that it would come right. And I went, you know, I was I was always basically three weeks behind where I needed to be that season. So like where I was at Europeans, um, I needed to be, you know, four weeks before. And so I was always kind of chasing um but the season wasn't going to slow down i just had to catch up so it was it was like that basically um and then getting to i i think i got i got myself to the best possible position i could come the world championships given what had happened um but i still felt if i'd had a couple more weeks it would have just unlocked that last little bit of race speed um but fundamentally had a had a really good regatta in terms of performance um like doing like my best races when they counted so that was good like I was saying before like the the semi-final was so nerve-wracking it was a crazy competitive world championships like I'd obviously done an Olympic qualifying world championships in 2015 and it was the hot then but this was like unbelievable the, there was like 38 entries in the singles so wow. had quarters and stuff yeah it was fierce um so seven, over 75 percent of all the people who entered were not going to qualify yeah yeah and how many races are you doing so, I mean, the max would be five, obviously, if you did, had to do the rep, but minimum four. Uh, but that was over eight days, whereas you do, I've done four over a World Cup, which is over three days. So that's yeah. brutal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was like, you just don't want to be in the B final because top three in the B final get through, the rest don't even go see Olympics. So that is a race you do not want to be in. So it's all about the semi final uh, and getting yourself into the A final. And um, especially if you know, you're, unless you're like a clear, you know, I think it was Emma Twig that won that year. No, it was Sunita, um, the Irish scholar. She was miles ahead of everybody. Unless she was someone like that, like the semi-final was always going to be the race of like dread. And semi-finals just are, right? It's like, it's like everything to lose, nothing, nothing to gain really because you just get, you know, you want to, if you, yeah, you want to be in the final to win a medal. And um, so it's just about just, you know, getting into that position. So it's just always a, horrible race i know uh, people who talk about the olympics say the hardest racing in the semi-final because everyone who goes to the olympics goes to make an a final yeah not everyone goes to medal yeah that's yeah. true yeah, yeah yeah so no one's there's no give up there's no yeah 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 and just people do yeah sometimes you see people do crazy things in olympic qualifying races like like superhuman stuff sometimes it looks like right um so yeah so the semi-final was the big one um i don't think i don't think i'm second even remember where i finished and it's just so funny is i maybe second We've got in the, the semi in, but, the, in the final fourth in the final yeah yeah in the final fourth um but yeah but i kind of i i knew silver and gold were taken i guess that year but i was like um racing the american for the bronze uh but she was just better than me on the day um but i was yeah i was really happy with the overall performance given the season and the struggle to get back to fitness not bad fourth in the world not bad yeah. not bad yeah. especially the thing i seem to, yeah, I seem to like fourth and i and then you know but um, yeah, no, it was uh, it was it was okay, and it's like okay, right, we can build from here. Back on it now. Yeah, and then in the end, <laughs> you got a little bit longer than you thought. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, God, the whole world stopped, didn't it? And we were all, you know, gearing up for the trials. I think at that point, um, when it all was like, right, you need to go home. So, yeah, COVID was a weird time. Obviously, being an athlete, um. <laughs> In terms of being a single scholar, it wasn't much different. I was still in the ergo on my own, not in the vote on my own, but I just didn't have my team team around me. So you're just doing everything from home. But I was, I remember chatting to the girls before we left Caversham on the last day. And I said, obviously the whole world is like upside down. No one knows what's happening, but we just take the strength from, we know what we have to do. We just carry on training. We don't go on the water, no, but we still keep on the ergo like keeping that focus and having that focus of training i was really grateful through yeah, yeah. and then obviously just being lucky to not, you know not be in the position that um a lot of people found themselves in out of work or you know working in the hospitals all that kind of stuff so we were kind of and we where we live we had like outdoor space and stuff like that so i was you know lucky in that way but just having the focus on but it was, I think it was the uncertainty for a while. It was like, are the Olympics going to happen, aren't they? And then once they'd made the decision, it was like, thank God they've made a decision, even though it was, you know, it was like, okay, it's not happening this year. Um, 
But at least then once you know the decision, you can come up with a plan. I hate being in limbo in life. Like I just hate that. As, if we've got a plan, I'm fine, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, even though it was like, oh God, I've got another, I've got to do another year. Because, um, you know, four years is a long time, right? Yeah. And she needs Olympics. But adding that extra year on, like training program wise, they had to get quite, you know, they had to think about that. You can't, the, the body only has, you know, a time scale when it, when you're building through an Olympiad in terms of the program, right? What do they do? It's like, it was kind of like a holding year, 2020, wasn't it? So, um, so keep fit, keep focused, but then equally you need to then kick on again for the next year. So it was a, it would have been quite hard for the coaches how to kind of yeah. manage that. And also for the athletes, like quite a few of them have retired when they found out that the Olympics were postponed in like in 2020, like Tehran, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I guess where it was where you were in your career and how you felt things were going as to. I think you can see when your body's hanging on. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the pressure. I think sometimes you say you look at Olympics, oh God, they look like, no, like the fittest, most incredible, most amazing performing people like actually like the what you're putting your body through you're just hanging on the yeah. thread especially in olympic year like again 2021 it was a, not as bad as 2016 but it was it felt like it was weird like you think you're going to be the most motivated in olympic year but i was fighting to find motivation in both those olympic years especially 21 maybe it was because it had been a five-year olympiad and it's a long slog in the single as well um but i was struggling in that year yeah. to find that motivation and it's funny you think the closer you get to the Olympics, the more like the more low space you'll get, but it's not necessarily the case. I remember chatting to Catherine actually on camp in a viz in twenty twenty one and it was still like umming and ahhing about the Olympics and I wasn't having and I was I wasn't quite right. I had like some form of virus I, when I was out in camp, so I couldn't train properly. Um I was getting really frustrated and again I was close to just being like, I can't I just I'm not sure I can carry on with this. Um I remember chatting to Catherine on the phone and she said I felt the same a lot of the Olympic years. It was of the time when I find would find it as you, you would think you would kind of get really ex that excitement would ramp up, but sometimes that's not necessarily the case. And I was like, okay, it's not just me. It's one of those things, isn't it? You think sometimes it's just you. And but it's like, nah, it's quite common. People can feel like that. So I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going mad. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a, that was a hard, hard winter to get through. It wasn't wasn't going as smoothly as I as I wanted it to. So um, yeah, but like I say, every time it's just keep leaving keep the process and yeah it'll it should hopefully will come right in the end <laughs> yeah. yeah not much racing that season then into you got like two two races before tokyo i can't even remember now i think there was like a oh the europeans days. yeah um and then did we do one more i think we were yeah like we wanted to race but then we also wanted to be careful not to be going everywhere and risk picking up covid and um and then because that's that was the thing it was it wasn't even just if you picked it up and you, but it didn't affect you or whatever like if you picked it up you could still be testing positive three months later and you, you needed a, a negative pcr to fly and it was just so it's stressful enough the games right but then adding that covid stress onto it was just yeah yeah by the end of it i was like i'm done i'm done worrying math this is so annoying like it was just yeah you, all you were thinking about was just yeah washing hands a million times a day and like everybody but it was just it was super more heightened right because it, yeah. it would be you know a career ender olympiad ender and so so yeah, so I think we yeah I think we raced twice. I can't remember. It's so bad. It's only two years ago, but it feels like a lifetime mm -hmm. going now. Um, but yeah, Europeans was an okay result. Um, but yeah, I mean, going into the games, I was pretty. I'm trying to think now. Was we had um I had a really good camp um and was feeling like wasn't feeling like super confident but knew i think it's just the depth of the field like you didn't know depending on what race you were in with the people that were in it it was just like such a deep field of really good scholars that but some of them i could i knew some of them had like their weaknesses in the water in like rough water so when we got out to tokyo and it was i'd had to work really hard to get better in rough water i wasn't naturally good in rough but i just i kind of learned to get better and whenever it was blowing a hoolie and cabersham i'd always make sure i went out because it was like even though it was miserable just the more rough water practice you can get and then when we turned up to tokyo and there's bloody wind turbines on the course i was like how do they pick these legs to like them so windy um but yeah but then that played into my favor a little bit was some of the skillers that i was racing probably on flat water days they were quicker than me but in the rough water I, I was confident that I would um, go over the top of them. So 
but yeah, it was just the depth of field that you, I, I knew I was in a really good place. Um, and I felt on the top of my game, but I just knew there was so many other girls that were on top of their game. And it was just about like, who was going to get it right on the day. Um, and that was just to get into the final, let alone before we started thinking about medals. So, yeah. um, but leading into, leading into the games, like me and Reedy had a really good chat about expectations and results because obviously we focus on results and when you go into the Olympics is about medals um but we if I think if you for me if you focus too if I focus too much on results I think it, this will be the same for most people you obviously come away from the process mm -hmm. and um you come away from what you can control so we talked about performance versus result um and we both agreed that the result a good result and a result we'll be really happy with would be a medal um of any color um but the performance it was the performance was going to be the best i wanted to go out and show the world show myself show our project what 14 years of rowing and work was and then obviously the last five in a single culminated in and like everything i'd learned and put into the best races of my career in the boat class i'd always dreamed about being at the olympics in and if i did that and crossed the line having had my best performances and rode my best races, regardless of the result, I could be, I could sleep at night, you know, mm. and leave the sport in a place that I would be comfortable to leave it. Um, and fundamentally, that's what happened. Yeah. Um, the semi-final was so hot. I remember coming off from the quarter, I had, I had a good quarter, I think. And then Reedy was like, do you want to know the draw for the semi? I was like, oh, because I knew I was, I mean, they were both hot semi-finals but i'd got the hottest spot it was like it was basically like a world championship final line i was like okay great i have to beat someone i've never beaten before um and yeah basically everyone in that race i've it, i've they've beaten me or and some of them i've never beaten before so it was it was a really hard semi um but this and i yeah i was bricking it before the semi i think i had to it was there was normally there was meant to be a day or two before but um between the races but they because of all the weather and stuff it got delayed so i had to wait an extra day and those days waiting to race that race were hell on earth like you just you try to like switch off you try to get the nerves out of like out of your stomach but you just couldn't like you've wait the only time you wouldn't were be nervous would be when you were asleep like for three days i've i've explained it to people i mean i i've only done <laughs> under trade reason things and never never an olympics but i'm um, explaining to people like how nervous you are I sort of say, oh, do you, you know, do you watch football? Like, yeah, I've got my football team. Like, you know, when your football team's having like a penalty shootout, and yeah. you're really, really nervous. That's minimum level. Of yeah, nervous. yeah. That's as low as it ever gets. Yeah. And then what happens is you walk around and you're walking down to breakfast down the stairs, and then you remember where you are, and then like, yeah, hit, yeah, hit you again. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. You can kind of get it back down to like watching your team have a penalty nerves, and then uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, it's not. It's not a night because you you're basically waiting for the inevitable and you want it to come but then you don't want it to come and it's yeah, yeah. I remember speaking to Angus Groom actually and he and he described it really well he's like everything feels like on like I guess on like su you're super sensitive to everything you're super sensitive to noise you're super sensitive everything feels like yeah everything's heightened when you're in that kind of state of anticipation and adrenaline and nerves and whatever. Um, and yeah, I was, I remember she FaceTiming Rick and I literally was in tears. I was like, these, this is overwhelming me, like the nerves. And it's like, this is, it's such a privileged place to be, isn't it? I'm at the Olympic Games, like being a sports person, living the dream. And oh, it's so overwhelming and so nervous. But that's how it felt. Like it felt emotionally just, yeah, it, it, I, and kind of incredible because it's like, it means so much and like the enormity of it is. And you feel like you're racing the world and it's it's really cool. But it, I literally, yeah, it came out in tears. I'm not someone that cries very often, but it came out in tears. And he's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I'm just, honestly, I just don't, I'm just so nervous. This is just, yeah. He's like, you're fine, just breathe. Like it was, yeah, it, it's, it's what it gets you. It's like, yeah, it really does. Um, so yeah, De racing that semi, I was like that leading into it, but I had the best race of my career and it was, it was better than the final, slightly better, um, but it was slightly better. But in the way I had to have, Reedy says you have to have the race of your life to make it to the Olympic final. Like that's how big this race is and how big, the, uh, how good the, op uh, um, the opposition are. So 
Um, and then you have to do it again, again the next day, yeah, 23 yeah. hours later. Yeah. 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 But everyone is safe for everybody. Yeah. Same for everybody. Um, but for me personally, because my top end is not my strength, like I'm a big like endurance based athlete, like not having that extra, that day in between the semi and final like you're meant to, if I find it harder to recover that top end fitness, not top end fitness, that top end energy system, um, as well as some maybe some other athletes. So I always was like, it's not ideal that it's there's not a day between But to have the race of your life. Yeah. On the race that you needed to have. Yeah. Yeah. Fourteen year career. Yeah. I mean, cool. ideally you would have it in the final. And the final was a very close second, but it was yeah. just I just didn't have that that top one, two percent fire in the start that I did the day before. But, just for the nature of recovering and But saving anything you I can't couldn't, save. I couldn't I couldn't I had to give everything and I had to race that hard. Um and yeah, the I beat the um I came second beating the Austrian um Lobnig by half a second and then she was the one that beat me by half a second in the final she got it on the right day and the day, day that counted right but um yeah you couldn't I couldn't save anything in the semi-final it had to be everything I had to to get into the final so um and I kind of celebrated like it was the final but I, I was just yeah it meant a lot just to get just to get into that final and then be like now it's the fun part right yeah. racing for medals yeah. um and I was, yeah, I was super excited for the final, but it was, it took me a while to come down from the, I was, yeah, it was so buzzed after and so high after the semi final because of everything that had gone into it. The come down was, it took me a while to switch off to then, you know, get to sleep that night. It was noisy in the village, all that kind of stuff. Not ideal place to, to be trying to get a good night's sleep in the village, unfortunately. Yeah. And then you wake up the next morning and you're like, right, got to get the energy levels back up again. Your body's like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, but again, had a had a really good race in the final and we'd worked a lot on like getting rate in the middle of the race and just getting my rate up to like 33. Um, and yeah, had a great middle and then had a, I generally don't have very good sprints at the end, but it worked a lot on that. And I had a, Really good last 500 for me, um, but it wasn't quite enough to to get over the top of um, Lobnig for the bronze. But uh, and that's what I was racing for. I was racing for the bronze. The gold and the silver were were taken. But uh, obviously anything can happen. But if you're realistic going into the race, right, you have a plan of who you're trying to turn over. But then the whole field was tighter. Like I didn't realize how close I was to going fifth. So, um, but fundamentally, of course, fourth people say fourth's the worst place to come. I think last is. But <laughs> um, the <laughs> Um, but you know what? I, I, there was a lot of me that was gutted, but like I say, my performance was, it was the best I could have done. So I couldn't, I couldn't do much more than that. Not only was it the best you've ever done and you could have done, it was also the best that any female athlete has ever done in a single skull in the history of this country. Yeah. Yeah. That was quite cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I just also with the single, it was about hoping to try and encourage more girls to like press for that boat because I think not many people it's kind of the boat that people have been in if they kind of haven't made the boat they wanted or whatever whereas no like let's people want to you know should be girls should be pushing to to be the, the top scholar and being the top the top boat being the single rather than like the boat you want to try and stay out of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that was kind of I was hoping to like yeah motivate other people to be like nah we can yeah I'm good enough to take on the single and have a, have a crack at it so um, so yeah, so in a, you know, as much as leaving there with a bit of metal would have been, would have been the icing on the cake, the end of my career. Um, you didn't need it. It would have been nice, of course. Um, and two Olympic medals is better than one, but, um, I one, walked away very proud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's all you could do. Yeah. I walked away very proud of, of my performances and that's all you could do. Yeah. Yeah. So you should. Yeah. It was also like, must've been a completely different Olympics, but it must've felt so different to London and Rio. Like it was. It, it just wasn't the same. I'm no, as was the people. Was... Yeah, no, no spectators, and yeah, it was it was a definitely a weird one. Mm. So yeah. after that one, did you know you were done? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And since then, leaving the sport, have you reflected in any other ways over it? Or what? You know, what? I had a big fear about how I would manage coming out of the sport. Yeah, and it's not been as bad as I feared, which is nice. Um, I think it's all it's a it continues to be a process because it wasn't like I was very clear in what I was doing next. So, you know, 
some athletes, you know, they're, like they're qualified doctors, so like they're going to be a doctor, so they know exactly the path they're taking. I was like, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. I'm now working, managing the family business and looking to do a few other things on the side as well. But um, that wasn't a clear path for me, so it was a bit uncertainty there. Um, and But fundamentally, I left. I was very lucky to leave under my terms um, and then I think that I think that helps with kind of figuring it. And I was excited for life afterwards, right? I was excited to have some freedom, have weekends, go away when you want, like enjoy time with Rick. Like he's literally he finished rowing in 2012, and then has been like <laughs> leading, the, living his life by the rowing calendar for 10 years after that. So um, it was nice, to, yeah, to do stuff together, go on holiday in June, not just September, yeah. stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a transition, but I, I so far it's been good. I, what the thing I miss? I don't necessarily miss rowing. I miss being really good at something, having a really clear purpose to every single day, having a really clear goal. Like I'm very goal orientated. Um, need a plan. I don't really have that at the moment. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find my feet are still, but it's it's okay. I'm kind of enjoying the. I I lo love learning though, so I love kind of not being very good at something and learning how to be better in it as well. So learning that in business at the moment with the family business got into my dog training yeah, yeah so, I've seen a lot of that yeah. on Instagram yeah so that's kind of my new competitive like yeah. streak coming out um so yeah got a got one dog he was just did like a lot of pet training like pet dog obedience training with him um but then I found a sport so bought a puppy for the sport so going down that route that's very time consuming and yeah I used to do ride horses so it's very similar working with animal um so I'm really enjoying that and that's kind of giving me a bit of a focus and I'm obviously don't know what i'm doing at all i'm complete beginner at it so um yeah that's, that's really challenging sometimes. yeah yeah it's good isn't it it's nice to like yeah uh, and so the like tim was saying something you know where you do something as good as you uh, to the level you do in rowing you know if you make your 2k time two seconds faster every year you've had an amazing year yes yeah. when you're brand new you can make huge gains yeah yeah, yeah exactly so um so yeah, generally just in, enjoying life after 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 rowing, really. Yeah, awesome. And uh, it's nice to look back and chat about it like this again. You know what? You know, remembering the remembering those times again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's so many episodes we're gonna have on like life after rowing, and, yeah, and just talking about purpose and like even other guests like Alex Partridge, etc. Like we kind of came to the conclusion of you need. Unless, unless you have something that's really stimulating, uh, as a rower that's retired, it's going to be really difficult to find something to like, attach yourself to, like in the long term, like more than like a year or two or three. So. Yeah, I think you fundamentally have to just accept that you're. It's very rare to find something you're going to be as passionate about that's going to give you the same sense of purpose. Because if you try and find that, it you probably you're not going to. Like yeah. if you do, then you're really lucky, but you're yeah. probably not going to. So you have to accept. And like, just look back and try and be like grateful that you had that period where you were able to row and basically do a sport you love for your job. Like, finish rowing and it'd be your job to go and lie on the sofa and watch Netflix, right? I really miss afternoon naps, basically. So it's like, <laughs> You're not the first person. It's so. not socially acceptable now to have afternoon naps. <laughs> it's not part of your job. So, I can't remember who said it to me first, but one thing I really liked is someone who said you can miss something without wanting it back. Yes. Like it's okay to look really nice at time yeah. and be like, oh, I miss doing that. Yeah. But it doesn't mean I want to do it now. Yeah. Just because I have that feeling doesn't mean it's what I want now. Yeah. And I think some people get kind of lost in that. Like, I like that actually because I'll use that because that's I think that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I miss being good at something. <laughs> we're, nearly, we're nearly at four, so we better ask. We've got a few quick five questions. Okay. Awesome. Number one is going to be very um, unpredictable. How do you move a single first? <laughs> wow. Uh, that is a really good question. I think when you start, when I started out, really would always say, look at somebody who is your, your body and your makeup is like, and try and r skull a little bit like them. So for me, it was Nat Koba. She wasn't necessarily the strongest athlete in the field, but she rode and used her strengths to the best of her ability and was obviously very, very fast. But then once I got better then mold your own way of doing it so i so i kind of like tried to emulate someone who was similar to me but then i then it was like but now create vicky thornley in the single that someone else wants to recreate if that makes sense so, let's start with that then build on top yeah yeah i would say any clues for how you can do that 
Um, well, watch a lot of races, watch a lot of um, videos of people rowing well and technically well in the single. Um, it's a boat that you have to, I think a lot of people, especially if you come from an eight or something, it's all about getting, you know, the basically smash, smashing the front end, if you like, you, and the eight, you've got to be quick on it, quick legs, whatever. But the single, you've got to just wait for that. Like, don't try, the work will find you. It'll come, it'll yeah. come, you know. Yeah. Don't look for the work in the single. Um, it's a slow moving boat. Um, so yeah, just let the work come. Don't try and find it for sure. Cause it's, yeah, you, you, otherwise you'll just blow your legs up. Awesome. So the next question I've got is out of all the training venues and race venues and, you know, rowing legs that you've trained at, visited or, or raced at, what are some of your favorites? Oh, it's easy. Varese. Yeah, I heard that one. <laughs> yeah. Um the girl the girls are there at the moment for a month and I was like, that is the dream. Um <laughs> Gelanto, Pasta, literally ten steps from your bed is the lake. It was amazing. Um yeah, Varese, I love it. Um the mountains when you see it, especially like around April time, it was very clear, so you could often see the mountains so so capped. It was beautiful. Um and it's fast as well on the course if it is a nice tailwind. Uh so love Varese and Bled is amazing in Slovenia, like just a beautiful lake. Um, really washy, but you kind of forgive it. And then the other one has got to be Lucerne. Never won a medal the first year of rowing in seniors in 2010. I won a bronze there, never won a medal since, but made my first A final in the uh, in the single in Lucerne uh, in 2014, maybe. Um, so that was good memories. But yeah, never. it's really hard to do well in Lucerne, um, but it's still just hands down the most amazing lake to row on so yeah awesome i'd like to ask if you could travel back in time to the you when you first really uh got the boat for rowing um and could give that young you advice what piece of advice would you give yourself um i would just say keep just keep believing and keep working hard so between and even if the results don't come if you keep plugging away you know, you'll, you'll, you will see the rewards for it. Um, I think when I went from 2011 to 2016 without really winning a major medal, I had to keep a lot of belief. Um, yeah. But by the time I got that Olympic medal, it was worth those five years of, you know, I'd have been on the medal on the podium before that, but um, in between those years, but it, the, that silver medal at the Olympics was the one that mattered. And so, yeah, just keep, just keep plugging away at it. Um, yeah. Also a good one. I got last one, and that is what? Are, who are some of your uh, rowing idols that are the people that you've looked up to during your career? Um, yeah, good. You know what? It's not always some. It's not always necessarily the people with the best results, the most medals. I've always respected the athletes that just don't give, just don't give up, and have like just stuck at it and got to got there and like sometimes just got there in the end. Um. And I think the people I looked up to the most was a Katarina Castle in terms of like her single sculling prowess and her ability to keep going in that event. Like it is yeah. brutal and doing it Olympiad after Olympiad after Olympiad is immense. I think she did seven Olympics in the end, six in the single, like crazy. Wow. Um, so she's just, yeah, just an absolute hero. Um, so yeah, she's probably the person that I just think the strength of and resilience you must have to have done that in that event and over that amount of time is like mind boggling. So yeah, she's probably my hero. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, Vicky, it was so nice to like catch up with you again and, and have a chat and we'd love to have you back on again and say hi to Rick. Thank you. I will do. Thanks guys. Yeah, it's awesome. Thanks very much for coming on. It's really good. Um, Awesome to hear your experience. And I think just like so valuable for other people to hear that everyone struggles, everyone has the same problems, the same fears, and no matter what you're doing. And I think your bit of advice is, yeah, just keep going. It's like, they can't really get much better than that. Thank you. Awesome. So on that note, easy there. Cue the music. <laughs>